Good evening, everyone. My name is Derek Pratt, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programming here at the Erie Canal Museum. Thank you very much for joining us today. The impact of the Erie Canal has been immense, socially, economically, and politically. But it was not operating in a vacuum, and thousands more miles of canals crisscrossed the U.S. starting in the early 19th century. These canals were each unique in their own ways, but also shared a number of similarities, interacting with each other in a national network of transportation, trade, and communication. The aim of this series of talks, Canal Conversations, presented by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, is to explore these various North American canals and discover more about our shared histories. Uh, tonight, we are honored to host this Canal Conversation uh, with Martha Capwell Fox of the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor and Rebecca Jones Macko of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, which interprets the Ohio and Erie Canal. Uh, Rebecca should be here soon. She was having some uh, technical issues, but just wait. She'll be here too. A uh, few minutes. Someone from Fabius. Nice. Um, real quick. Um, I'd also like to uh, encourage you, uh, if you're here tonight, to attend our next lunchtime lecture at the Erie Canal Museum, which is tomorrow, October 19th at noon. And that talk will also be both virtual and in person and recorded as well. Uh, Town of Sullivan historian, 30 year employee of the Marcellus Casket Company, uh, right here in Syracuse, Mike Beardsley, will examine a unique artistic medium. Uh, that sprung up along the Erie Canal, the American Casket, in his talk, Underground Novelties, a humorous history of the American Casket. <laughs> we'll, we'll send out a, a link. Um, Please do. I'm, I'm going to sit in on that one. Yeah, it should be fun. You know, it's yeah. a good, good talk for October. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let's talk a little about um, tonight's uh, discussion. Um, so we're doing a roundtable discussion here. Um, so each one of our panelists is going to introduce our canals for about 10 minutes. Um, then we're going to talk amongst ourselves for another 10 to 15 minutes um, about whatever has come up uh, over the last 30. Uh, then we'll field uh, some of your questions. Uh, please uh, type any questions you might have into the chat, and we will try our best um, to get to them. Um, so, with all of that said, uh, without further ado, we'll get started, and we're going to start out, because um, I'm sure you're not tired of hearing me talk yet, um, <laughs> with, um, well, we, we were doing this originally in uh, the order in which the canals were completed, but then Rebecca had her issues. However, we're still going to start with the Erie. Um, all right, this looking good to everyone? Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah. So we will get started and learn a little about the Erie Canal. All right. Uh, so to understand the Erie Canal, you've got to understand a bit about uh, New York State's geography uh, and New York uh, before there was a canal. So here it is, New York. Um, New York has a lot of natural waterways, and very importantly, it has uh, two really big waterways. Uh, you've got the Hudson River here um, connecting the Atlantic Ocean, connect to anything, but it heads up uh, and passes through the Appalachian Mountains. Then also, right here, uh, you have what's really important for the Erie Canal, and that is the Mohawk River Valley. Um, this uh, river formed um, along with the Hudson at the end of the last ice age. Um, and together, these carve um, this path under 600 feet in elevation uh, through the Appalachians and the Adirondack Mountains, um, allowing for this um, incredibly unique pass uh, through the mountains between the East Coast and the interior uh, of the continent, specifically to the Great Lakes. Um, and indeed, um, people have been for thousands of years taking advantage of these natural waterways, um, including uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, um, which has 
uh, inhabited upstate New York um, from time immemorial. Uh, and then European settlers starting in 1600 start moving up these rivers as well, um, using their natural advantages. But they're not perfect rivers, uh, especially the Mohawk, which was a pretty uh, wild river with rapids and waterfalls and whatnot. You had to portage around a lot of obstacles. It also, when you get near Rome, New York, uh, turns north into the uh, Adirondacks foothills and isn't really navigable anymore. So you'd have to carry your boat overland um, to a little stream, Wood Creek, uh, that could take you into a network of lakes and rivers that could either take you to Lake Ontario or the Finger Lakes. Um, so this was not an ideal situation um, for transportation. And in the early uh, 19th century, um, a number of New Yorkers uh, would lobby for the construction of a canal uh, all the way uh, across New York, connecting Lake Erie uh, to the Hudson River, therefore the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the kind of spearhead, uh, political spearhead of this was uh, DeWitt Clinton, um, usually called the father of the Erie Canal. There are a number of uh, other folks as well involved in this. Um, common question we get at the museum, why do they go to all the way to Lake Erie instead of Lake Ontario? There's a number of reasons for that, um, including Niagara Falls is right there, um, separating Lake Ontario from all the others. Um, and there's a lot, but I got 10 minutes, so we're not going to get into that uh, <laughs> thing, right? Um, but anyway, uh, 1817, they begin digging the Erie Canal in Rome. Uh, it will take eight years, uh, and it is paid for uh, and owned and operated, still is to this day, by New York State, which I think uh, ownership and who constructed is going to be an interesting discussion in our, our topic later of comparing and contrasting. But anyway, uh, the Erie Canal, when it is completed, 1825, will be 363 miles long. Uh, it overcomes 571 feet of elevation, with Lake Erie being its highest point. And it accomplished that originally through 83 uh, lift locks, costing the state a little over $7 million um, to construct. Um, and it was um, a transformative waterway. Um, before the canal opens, it took about a month uh, to go from Buffalo to New York City. Shipping a ton of wheat would have cost around $100, according to the number of estimates I've seen. Um, after the canal, it takes five to seven days to make the same voyage and costs uh, less than $10. Um, so this ushers in a transportation revolution for New York. But let's talk a little about why it's, it's important in a number of ways, including um, its construction. Uh, it's also recognized by the American Society of Civil Engineering as um, the birthplace of American civil engineering. Um, and it's a lot of local engineers. Um, so up at the top here, you have uh, two chief engineers of um, the project. You've got Benjamin Wright, who is the chief engineer of the Erie Canal, and James Geddes, who is um, really important in engineering and was chief engineer uh, of uh, the Champlain Canal uh, as well. Uh, and I believe we're going to be meeting James Geddes uh, again later in this talk. Um, so they're kind of these two major figures, uh, but they also have a number of very talented assistants who themselves are these self-taught engineers um, who are going to lay the foundation for American civil engineering for years to come um, throughout the whole country. Uh, you've got Canvas White, uh, Nathan Roberts, John B. Jervis uh, are among them. Again, though, I've only got 10 minutes. I'm not bordering on like <laughs> three minutes, and I haven't even gotten past building it. But So I'm going to keep moving. And there's a lot of different engineering uh, kind of feats accomplished by the Erie Canal, uh, not just those locks, um, but you've also got aqueducts. Um, this is the Montezuma Aqueduct second longest on the system. This is the, the Richmond Aqueduct, the large canal. Um, and uh, impressively, there's the uh, Lockport Flight of Five Locks overcoming the Niagara Escarpment that Niagara Falls falls over through a staircase of five locks. Um, really an engineering marvel of its day. Um, and this canal uh, built 
largely by just sheer manpower. Um, this is them excavating the deep cut out by Lockport. Um, you can see some rudimentary cranes, but a lot of this is done with shovels and um, kind of, you know, and, and a lot of whiskey. Uh, that's another <laughs> major uh, tool. There we see uh, that deep cut uh, complete. Uh, that's another one of the engineering marvels of the Erie. Um, so uh, it's actually, it's incredibly successful. Um, the original canal, four feet wide, or four feet deep, 40 feet wide, is expanded 10 years later to be 70 feet wide and seven feet deep. Well, they start the expansion 10 years later, takes them another 30 uh, to get that done. Um, but then they also uh, build a number of side canals off of the Erie um, because ever after the Erie opens, you have a period of what's called canal mania in every corner of New York State. Uh, and as we will soon see, uh, every kind of corner of America wants its own canal as well, right? Uh, and a number of towns and cities boom along the canal, uh, including um, you know, my museum's hometown. This is Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, it transports, um, its big product is salt, uh, producing between 70 and 80% of the nation's salt in the mid uh, 1800s. Uh, the Salt City booms. Uh, before the Erie Canal opened, there were 250 residents. By the end of the century, there will be 100,000 residents in Syracuse. I mean, Buffalo is gonna see similar growth, Rochester, Albany, Utica, uh, you name it, um, they're all gonna grow as the canal uh, passes through them. Um, here, you can kind of see this line running down the middle. You can see the rest of Syracuse radiating out. I wanna just zoom in real quick on the intersection of that canal and the Oswego Canal. You know, so New York State, they build this canal, they pay for it. How did they pay for it? Um, well, you've got weight locks. Um, that's how tolls were collected on the Erie. Uh, every good on it um, had its own toll uh, assessed. You would bring your boat into this waylock, um, work the same way as a lock. You know, you close off the gates, drain the water, but instead of going to a different level, level instead you rest on a giant scale. Um, they knew the weight of your empty boat, and uh, you could do some quick math and know how much you had in your boat, and you got charged for it. Uh, New York was able to pay off the original canal in 10 years. Um, so um, we can see really the economic success uh, of this model. Ultimately, $121 million tolls will be collected over the canal's lifetime. Um, and uh, I also highlight the Waylock uh, because importantly, whoops, uh, it is, this is the one of seven Waylocks. This is Syracuse's. It's the only one still standing. Uh, and it is the home of the Erie Canal Museum. So. Check it out sometime. Um, yeah, and like I said, um, the Erie is going to be successful enough uh, that not just every other part of New York wants a canal, but also many other parts of the country. I'm uh, sorry, Martha, that this map <laughs> I ripped off the internet, I don't think has the Delaware or Lehigh. It doesn't begin to cover Pennsylvania. <laughs> no, yeah, um, but we'll get into that later. Uh, but it's not just economic success the Erie Canal has. Um, there's also a number of social movements that spring up on its banks. Uh, first, you've got the Second Great Awakening, a religious revival movement, um, which calls for a more perfect society. Uh, out of that spring a number of reform movements, including uh, the abolition movement, abolition. state New York is a hotbed of, uh, and the women's rights movement. Um, these are both canal side monuments uh, in central New York. You've got the Jerry Rescue, an important uh, Underground Railroad uh, abolitionist um, rescue uh, during the era of the Fugitive Slave Act. And then this is in Seneca Falls, the Cayuga Seneca Canal um, in 1848, the first ever women's rights convention uh, in America was held um, here in Seneca Falls, right off of that canal. So, um, yeah, the canal creates this uh, major social change. Um, by the end of the um, 19th century, it was falling into decline. Uh, however, New York, 
1905 will authorize the construction of an even larger canal, uh, the New York State Barge Canal, um, which we can see being built here. Uh, obviously, different uh, equipment than before. Um, but um, that system uh, will remain competitive into the 1950s when the St. Lawrence Seaway finally opens up, um, even though it has to compete with uh, railroads and cars, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, the New York State Canal system still exists to this day. Um, you, you can't go from Albany to Buffalo anymore. Instead, it's Tonawanda to Waterford, which is less catchy. Um, shockingly, no one's written a song about that. But uh, yes, <laughs> New York State Canal system still in use today and is <clears throat> being used right now to move um, a great canal boat, which maybe we'll talk about later, but I've already gone a few minutes over. So um, yeah, so much happening on the canals. Maybe we'll get into that a bit later. Um, but we've got to move along, right? Um, so now, um, well, Rebecca, now that you're Rebecca. back with us, um, we can present <laughs> yours. So, uh, so for, for for our audience, my internet, I was doing mine from home and my internet was cutting out. So welcome to Cuyahoga Valley National Park to the Canal Exploration Center, a historic structure on the canal itself. So in just listening to Derek, there's like so many things that are parallels between the two canals, um, including kind of part of a name. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Ohio and Erie Canal, which goes from Lake Erie to the Ohio River in the south. So originally we were the Ohio Canal, but then somebody got jealous. And so then we had to be the Ohio and Erie for a reason we'll get to in a second. So if we could have the next slide. So just like Derek was saying, people caught canal fever because once we started building canals um, and people were seeing the success of the Erie Canal and seeing other successful canals, people got canal fever and wanted to build canals. Here in Ohio, we had a whole state that was full of resources, but no way to get it back to the East Coast or even get it down to the Mississippi to get it down to New Orleans and out to the world. What we needed was, as Derek has pointed out, a reliable transportation system. So if I could have the next slide. So the Erie Canal was first. It was already starting to be built. But people saw the Erie Canal and saw the Ohio and Erie Canal as two parts of the same in some ways. It's part of a interstate highway system, if you will, that would go from New York. You could go by boat from New York cross the Erie, the idea was come down Lake Erie, another boat, get on another boat for the Ohio and Erie Canal, go down to the Ohio River, get on another boat, go down the Ohio River to the Mississippi, get on another boat, go down to New Orleans, get on another boat and come back to New York. So Derek made mention of the many engineers. Many of the engineers, we borrowed some of that same technology, sometimes even the same engineers for our canal. Our canal had a driver though. If you can hit the inner button. Our driver was Alfred Kelly. He was also an engineer, self-taught like many engineers were at that time. And for those that aren't familiar, American engineering, civil engineering was born on these canals. He was our driver for these Ohio and canals. And he was a relentless driver. You know, the next slide. So people got canal fever. They proposed building a canal. And if you look at the state of Ohio here, you can see that on the right side of Ohio, there is this Ohio and Erie Canal. This was the first canal that was proposed, but that leaves half the state out cold. So Alfred Kelly and his companions proposed a second canal, the Miami in Erie, to, for the western part of the state. But he was from Northeast Ohio and he had this idea in his head. He was a driver to get this section from Lake Erie 
if you come down the, the map from Lake Erie in that upper right hand corner, you'll see a little dot for Brecksville Dam and then you'll see the Ohio and Erie Canal Office and Portage Lakes. That is at Akron. He was a driver to make sure that that section got done first to prove to the rest of the state that this was really going to work. Next slide. So even though the Erie Canal was not quite finished, we actually borrowed the governor from New York to come over and lift the first shovel full of dirt um, on July 4th, 1825 to start digging for the Ohio and Erie Canal. If you're familiar with history, 1825, 1827, this is during America's Jubilee. It's 50 years after the American Revolution. We wanna to prove to the world how progressive and wonderful and upcoming we are. And Alfred Kelly was driving that Northern section, making sure it would get done just like the Erie Canal dug by hand. There go my lights, <laughs> dug by hand. Same technique, same technology. But that first 30 miles was done in two years. They finished that first section and on the 3rd of July, 1827, a boat left Akron bound for Cleveland where it promptly arrived in beautiful downtown Cleveland as it was at that point. On the 4th of July, 1827, just in time for dinner. And what a huzzah greeted the, the canal boats when they arrived. Next slide. And Derek touched on this. When the canal came through, it changed everything. It changed how you lived. It changed your neighbors, money, clothing, what you ate, what you saw, what you heard. For some people, it changed their livelihoods. So if we can go to the next slide. So wherever the canal, remember I said it started, they were working between Cleveland and Akron. So Cleveland and Akron immediately started growing by leaps and bounds. The terminus was in Cleveland, but Akron was the high point. Portage, it was a short distance between two watersheds right there, between the Mississippi watershed and the Lake Erie watershed. They're only eight miles apart right there. So this was our high point. But because it was our high point, you spoke of engineering, we had to engineer a series of 15 locks, one right after the other. So a boat would literally go in one lock, come out and go right into another lock, go up a level, go right into another lock, up a level, and just keep going through 15 locks. So Akron was a natural stopping place. You mentioned way locks, and I was smiling because we had our way, one way lock at Cleveland and another one at Akron. Um, it wasn't too long before people figured out that they could maybe offload some of the weight from their boat, drive it around Akron and put it back on the other side, on the other side, past the way lock. Not that that ever happens with truck drivers today. Next slide. <laughs> so the canal when it opened, it started bringing in goods like lamps, fabric from the Eastern mills, China, goods that we couldn't get anyway else. Goods like, oh, coffee, tea, cinnamon, sugar, cloves, chocolate, things that none of us know anything about today. And in return, we were shipping stuff out. Next slide. The things we were shipping out were resources, pork, usually in the barrel, but sometimes on the hoof, corn in both the solid form, the flour form, and the um, liquid form. We shipped out uh, some clay goods. We shipped out coal. We shipped out timber. We were shipping natural resources out. And yes, oddly, some of the things that we were shifting in, shipping in and out was salt. We shipped in salt and we shipped out salt. So I'm not sure how that worked. But next slide. So one of the things that happens is that we see people changing here in Ohio. Um, on the left of your slide, you have what people were probably wearing before the canal. And then this is what children might be wearing after the canal came through. Homespun on the left, on the right is processed cotton. But the other thing that, that the canal brought in is next slide. 
<sighs> fashion. <laughs> It brought in Ladies Godie's book. It brought in these fashions. People, because they could get fabric cheaply, people suddenly were conscious of how they looked and how they dressed. And we actually have a shawl in one of the nearby museums that if we had to buy it today, it would be like a half a million dollar shawl. But it came because her husband was able to buy this cashmere shawl th through his income that he earned on the canal which was quite remarkable. So next slide. This is not because of the canal, but it just so happened to be at the same time with the canal that there was a shift in technology in kitchens from open hearths to iron stoves. So the canal is gonna bring in goods for you to use on your new brand spanking shiny iron stove. So the, it did change what people ate and how they ate. So. So we went from puddings to pies. So go, keep going with the next one. So wherever the canal went, immediately all kinds of new jobs open up. There's, you have to, if you have a canal, you've got to have boat yards, you've got to have liveries for your uh, animals. You've got to have harness makers, painters for your boats, lumber yards, you've got to have all these things. Oh, and then the canal people who are working on the boats are gonna need support services. So groceries, like the picture on the right, Monroe's grocery sprung up. All these businesses start popping up everywhere along the canal in Ohio. Next slide. But here's the thing, and actually this is the Canal Exploration Center. This is the building that I am in now. Um, but my half of the building is a little obscured by the trees. So this is the structure I'm in. If you had a structure on the Ohio and Erie Canal, when it opened, and it actually opened in completion in 1832, all the way, in those seven years, you could see your property go up 160% in value. Next slide. People got jobs. Now this may be a difference, and I don't, I don't know if you talked about this, Derek, or not, but most of our early canal boats were run by companies. The canal itself was, was like the Erie Canal, done by state bonds and run by the state initially. So you'd have canal boat captains like this gentleman, who is John Malvin, who actually was an African-American, a free African-American canal boat captain on the Ohio Erie. Next slide. So it was done by, by companies before the Civil War when it was in its heyday. But after the Civil War, there's more efficient means of transportation coming around. So you see a rise in family boats where you would grow your own crew, such as what this canal boat owner did. He grew his own crew. And yes, those are his kids in the picture. And it is washing day and I love this picture because the little girl in the water is washing shirts in the water. Next slide. We all know what eventually drove canal boat traffic into a loss. And that is if you look down in the corner and you can see the, the train coming through. We had trains coming through early. Um, eventually, um, the canal, which was state run, was run, turned over to private investigators and then the state brought it back. And then there is, which we can talk about later, a commonality in, eight, in 1905. Um, but then eventually in 1913, there was a flood that wiped us out. So there are more commonalities that we'll talk about a little later, but I think we have yet another canal to explore. Yes, we do, but thank you. Um, yeah, so next up, we're going to have Martha here. Um, oops, I did not stop my share, but oh well, we'll move right along here. Um, oh, oh, I that's, started the, I that's started actually the, the end. <laughs> my bad. Yes, that's uh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, actually, uh, after having listened to uh, Derek and Rebecca, uh, the Delaware and Lehigh system is a bit actually of an outlier. And its impact um, was actually of national significance, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, 
But um, here, I, ironically enough, I am starting with a picture of Waylock. Uh, this was the Waylock at Machchunk, the town now known as Jib Thorpe in Carbon County on the Lehigh River. And this was where the canal boats were loaded with anthracite coal, and then they were weighed on the downbound side um, on their way to uh, eventually to Philadelphia. Can I have the next slide, please? And the reason, the sole reason that the Lehigh Navigation um, was built when it was begun, um, the navigation itself actually began in 1819. And uh, uh, again, the sole reason for that was anthracite coal. Anthracite, the black regions in this, uh, in this map here, um, basically cover five counties in Northeastern Pennsylvania, Lackawanna, Luzerne, um, Carbon, uh, so, uh, Sus uh, Schuylkill, and Northumberland from Northeast to Southwest. And um, it encompasses about 400 square miles. And this is the largest deposit of anthracite coal anywhere in the world. Um, when it was first discovered at a couple of different places quite by accident in, in the 18th century, it was invariably discovered because it was so close to the surface, people just simply found it on the ground. Um, it's probably still the largest deposit of anthracite in the world, but the uh, lack of its commercial value nowadays, as well as the fact that a, what the remaining coal is so deep down that it's not economical to go after it, even if there was a market for it. But in any case, this was this deposit of anthracite. And um, beginning in about the um, late 18th century, Eastern Pennsylvania and its corresponding region in central New Jersey across the Delaware um, were the chief iron making areas of the American colonies. But the upshot of that industry, as well as the fact that this was one of the most densely populated parts of the American colonies, meant that 150 years worth of European settlement had essentially clear cut this area of not only good hardwood trees, which was largely used for making charcoal to use in those iron furnaces, but also of any kind of usable wood at all. So by about between 1790 and 1800, um, the populated areas, which basically were around Philadelphia, were beginning to experience America's first energy crisis because wood was becoming scarce and expensive. <clears throat> and um, so they started to look around for an alternative source of fuel. And some people having discovered the fact that there was this anthracite um, a little further up began to try to experiment with you introducing it as a fuel. Can I have the next slide please? And this was the first anthracite mine. And as you can see, it was a quarry. Now this, this drawing was actually made in the 1830s, but this mine was originally opened in 1732. And it was a cinch to get the anthracite out of the ground, scraped off the topsoil and there was the coal. Um, if anybody's familiar with the anthracite history, this is what's known as the mammoth vein. Um, and so it was very easy to get it out of the ground. The problem was that this mine, which is, was in what's now the town of Summit Hill in Carbon County, um, was 100 miles above north of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia in 1800 had about 42,000 people living in it. It was the largest city in North America. So you were looking at getting anything you wanted to sell in any quantity to Philadelphia. It was also probably the wealthiest city in North America at that point. So your market target was, was Philadelphia. But that 100 miles between Summit Hill, Sharp Mountain as it was then, and Philadelphia had virtually no roads. Um, what roads there were were terrible. The wagons of the time couldn't carry more than three or four tons, particularly of something heavy and bulky like coal. And so the succession of companies that bought this mine and tried to haul the coal to Philadelphia all lost their shirts. Um, there were a couple problems be, apart from the distance because it became so expensive. Um, anthracite, if you're familiar with it, is very hard. 
and shiny, and it's very hard to get it to ignite. And people were, even though they were worried about their, their fuel bills, didn't even consider that this thing that looked like a stone could possibly be a fuel. Um, the other problem with anthracite at that point is that when you do get it to catch fire, it burns very, 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 very hot, way hotter than any other solid fuel that human beings had been used to using. And so the folks that did try to use it invariably melted their, their fireplace grates um, and uh, it just generally was not accepted. So as I mentioned, successive people opened this mine, tried to get the coal to Philadelphia and everybody lost their shirts. Next slide. So in 1812, these two gentlemen, Josiah White on the left and Erskine Hazard on the right, opened a wire and nail mill on the banks of the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. And they needed a fuel because obviously if you're going to take hunks of iron and stretch them through a die to make wire or chop them up to make nails, you need to soften it up. And they were worried, of course, like everybody else about the fuel problem. And they managed to secure a load of, iron, of, of, of anthracite coal. And we know this because both of them wrote letters and kept diaries, thank heaven. I'm not sure what historians of the future are going to make of the 21st century. Um, but we know this story. They put the coal in their furnace in their shop. They couldn't get it to light. They got frustrated. They shut up the furnace. They sent everybody home for the night. A few hours later, one of their workmen went back to the, to the factory because he'd left his coat. It was like November. It was cold. When he opened the door of the building, it was warm inside. And when he looked at the furnace, it was red hot. And what they had accidentally discovered was when you burn anthracite, you put it in a closed furnace and you give it an updraft of air, of oxygen. So somehow, lost to history here, Josiah White summoned back his workforce. Now, well, the workmen summoned Josiah White and Josiah White called back his workforce. And overnight, they made a day's worth of work, which would have been a 12 hour day on one load of anthracite coal. So this was really the first known industrial use of anthracite coal in this country. Um, but it took them another six years before they decided to really get into this whole hog and they purchased that quarry mine up on, in, in Summit Hill. They did it for a number of good reasons because they thought their way through before they leapt into the coal business. Uh, both of them were very inventive people. Um, White was kind of more um, self-educated. He was a Quaker. He had had the benefit of pretty good basic education. Hazard, on the other hand, was the grandson of the man who founded Princeton. And his father was the first, the second postmaster general of the United States and the founder of the American insurance business. So he was from a pretty wealthy family. And Hazard also had a degree in math. So they had figured out how to beat all of the transportation issues moving coal, moving anthracite. So Hazard then started to beat the bushes among his family's wealthy friends and sell stock in what became known as the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company. And meanwhile, um, White went to the legislature in Harrisburg. Um, he happened to have in tow a con artist German who claimed he was an aristocrat tied to lots and lots of money in, in, in Europe. None of which was true, but he did speak German, which mattered a whole lot because that was what most of the legislature spoke was German. And they went to the legislature and they said, look, we'll be able to bring America into an industrial competition with Britain, which prior to that point, we were nowhere near that. Um, if you can help us get this coal to market um, and to do that, you have to give us the Lehigh River. The legislature said, sure, take the river, take the water rights, take the islands in the river, take the banks on either side, take the tributaries. We'll get this back and nothing flat. Everybody goes bust in this cockamamie coal business. Well, Pennsylvania got the Lehigh back in 1966. It was the only privately owned river in the United States. So next slide, please. Brother, just real quick, we're running. I got it. Lines. I got it. Yeah. I'm going to stop right here. They then proceeded to build dams on the Lehigh that had what were called bear traps, hydrostatic dams that allowed them to float boxes of coal from one dam to another 
all the way down the rocky, shallow, totally unnavigable Lehigh River. And that was White's contribution. Hazard's contribution was to build a nine mile road from the mine at Summit Hill that dropped 900 feet to the banks of the Lehigh River here in Mock Chunk. It was the first road in the United States, possibly in the world, that came down the hill in a standard declivity, meaning the same angle all the way down. And starting in 1820, they were delivering about 500 tons of coal a year to Philadelphia. And that was really the establishment of the successful water route delivery of anthracite coal. Then in 1827, they decided that given the amount of civil engineering uh, knowledge that had been established by building the Erie, they hired Canvas White. And Canvas White came to Pennsylvania with about a half, about 500 Irishmen in tow who had survived building the Erie. And he then constructed the two-way navigation, which survived until 1942. So there's my 10 minutes, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm willing to answer lots more questions because I didn't get to the really important part yet. <laughs> oh, well, what was the really important part? The really important part is that with abundant anthracite available, um, it, of course, did revolutionize the way people lived, as everyone else has mentioned. But the most significant thing is that in 1839, Lehigh Coal and Navigation hired a Welsh iron master who had figured out how to use anthracite coal to smelt iron in Wales. And the he and the man that he worked for in Wales had combined the heat of anthracite to not only go in the furnace, but to heat a hot blast which had been invented in Scotland, but had never really been put into use. And they were making far and away the most quantity of iron in Wales, in Britain, um, and very high quality. Lehigh Cole and Navigation brought this man to Pennsylvania. His name was David Thomas. And in 11 months, along a lock in a town that is now Catasauqua, he built the first successful anthracite-fired iron furnace coal that came on the canal using water power because we didn't have steam engines strong enough uh, that, to, to, to hold that kind of heat and pump that kind of water. And um, he put it into blast on the 3rd of July, 1840. And on the 4th of July, 1840, he made more iron in one day than a charcoal fired furnace could make in a week. And that was the beginning of the American Industrial Revolution. Two years later, another, another anthracite iron furnace began in Easton on the site of what is now Humor Park. And by the Civil War, the Lehigh Valley was the leading iron producing area of the United States. Wow, yeah, <laughs> impressive. Uh, I, yeah, did Pennsylvania ever end up doing anything with that uh, iron coal? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I know. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ever heard of Bethlehem Steel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, which actually relates um, to us too, because Bethlehem eventually moves up to. Uh, well, just yes, they Buffalo. sucked up Lackawanna and then they moved it. Yes, uh, they have their own kind of email. Um, yeah. I had a question for Rebecca that I posted. If I can leap ahead of the folks who are listening to us, go ahead. At Akron, why did they not build inclined planes instead of all those locks? That's a really good question. Um, maybe the technology had not caught up to our engineers yet. Could be, yeah. That, and that was a the little... other thing was by making those locks, it gave you a lot of falling water, which another engineer by the name of Simon Perkins was channeling into a tunnel to be captured power that then oh, became the driving okay. power for Akron for mills. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, it was, the, it, I was thinking of the Morris Canal, which, you know, the Lehigh and the Delaware connected to the Morris. And, you know, inclined planes are their middle name. <laughs> so one of the things that I, the, the, how did your canal boats move? What was the power? Mules. <laughs> Mules. So you had mules. Um, we had mules later, but horses early. And what about the Erie Canal initially? We were similar uh, horses, then transition over to mules, and eventually steam power uh, later um, in the 
yeah. And our modern canal, we've got diesel barges and stuff. Mm -hmm. but, right. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. Mules, it was from the get go. Um, the interesting thing, too, that's also a connection with the Erie, I am told, is that until the Delaware Canal was completed, which was built by the state and went from Easton to Bristol, which Lehigh Coal and Navigation desperately needed, really messed it up until they hired Josiah White to rebuild it and it finally worked right. But until that point, they were using Durham boats. And as I've been told by a few people who are big Durham boat fans in our area, that was also what was used at the get-go from the from the Erie because they were about the best freight boats that there were in the United States. Hmm. I don't know a whole lot about that, but uh, you know. <laughs> uh, on, on the topic of Akron, um, Rebecca, did you say Akron's the highest point? Akron is our highest point right. on the Ohio and Erie Canal. Yeah. Um, and so it's. So like, I was just curious, how do you guys, well, both of your canals, how do they feed themselves with like the Erie is the highest point uh, or Lake Erie is the highest point for the Erie. So uh -huh. Erie Canal. So we're higher than you. Yeah. So at, the, at Akron, just south of the highest point, there is a series of lakes. It was originally a, a very marshy land, but then they went in and improved the lakes, dug them deeper. They're, they were spring fed, dug them deeper. And those became what we today call the portage lakes. And that's where they got the water from that went in two directions. Got it. Yeah. yeah the, the Lehigh had the advantage of starting the navigation. Um, about 20 miles or more below the source of the river. And mm -hmm. the upper part of the river has a very high um, change in, in, in um, altitude. When they built the upper grand section between Mock Chunk and, and, and uh, uh, Whitehaven, which was only 20 miles, they had to, it was like a 600 foot change in elevation. And they built incredible, huge dams and huge deep locks. And they built like 26 of them on that teeny little space. Whereas the 46 miles from Mock Chunk to Easton, um, and that's all, that's one of the other big differences is this was a much shorter canal than you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. that we have 44 they had the locks. Advantage of, of, yeah, it, it had 49 locks originally, and they also used what was called the Slackwater system. They built mm -hmm. nine dams on the on the river mm -hmm. so they actually only had to dig 35 miles of ditch, ditch. and they built and nine they built dams nine. this was this was basically um it was it, white had the idea but it was canvas white that carried it out um it was really amazing and they got all that done in two and a half years for a million dollars um ahead of schedule and under budget <laughs> the ohio and area had the same thing ahead of schedule well not ahead of schedule but under budget Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I found it interesting, uh, Rebecca. When you mentioned how they built that one section really quick uh, to show it was feasible. New Erie had a similar thing. We do the middle division first. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it, ninety-ish miles um, in three years, um, right in the middle? So then you had to, you know, connect it the rest of them. Otherwise, yeah. It's and it is amazing, and I'm sure you both deal with this, particularly with kids, to emphasize that this was entirely done uh, by hand. By hand. You know, yes. human muscle, animal muscle, and simple machines. That was it. Mm -hmm. uh, Plows I, I, and pickaxes and shovels. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And I found it interesting. We were, for this is some inside baseball for everybody uh, <laughs> watching. Um, we were talking and an earlier conversation about how a lot of our um and you mentioned it a little too martha how um our workforces were sometimes like often the same people they yes mm -hmm. from one mm -hmm. to yeah the next. yeah yep. if you survived German one and irish yeah if you if you mm -hmm. survived one you you know you were in demand <laughs> yep yeah. we say for our canal unfortunately like you we were using German and Irish, but they say that on the Ohio and Erie Canal, there's got to be at least one Irishman for every mile of canal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just because disease swept through injury. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's, um, all right. Well, um, so there's our, our shop talk session, but now um, 
I'll I'll go to the Q and A, uh, and if anyone else has more questions, feel free to put them in the, the chat. I'm going to try to go through um, people who've been waiting though. Um, what <laughs> first one we'll have is from the American Canal Society. Check them out, folks. Um, but uh, noted that all three presenters uh, have their canals represented by national heritage parks. Uh, the mm -hmm. Park national Park. heritage areas. Yes. yes, yes, yes. We we are not a national park affiliate. Um, we're a private five hundred one c three within the corridor. Yes, yeah. yes. The car the corridor is 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 private. Yes. Yeah. Same same with us. We're um, a private museum within the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. But we're all. We're a national park site within a national heritage corridor. Uh, there we go. Uh -huh. So we're all sort of represented by, by our own heritage corridors, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do these parks work together in any manner, in manners of preservation, promotion, advocacy, et cetera? Is there a sharing of information of what works and what doesn't, I guess, between the different heritage parks? Um, yeah, there, there, is, there is regular meeting of the national heritage areas. I've never been mm -hmm. to one, but I know our executive directors go every year. And sometimes, um, and I can't speak for the Erie and for the Lehigh and Delaware, but we work with other canal parks, such as um, the Chesapeake and Ohio, uh, exchanging information. But yes, there should be more. And, and we use the, sometimes there's the um, Canal Society working with, and you had mentioned, Martha, that you've been to a meeting or two. So we also sometimes can work through those affiliated yes. groups. Mm -hmm. We've always got yep. the uh, World Canals Conference. I know that's mm -hmm. where I met you, Martha, I believe. Yes. Everyone yeah. should, who's watching, you know, come on down to Buffalo, uh, September of 2025. Ah. In Buffalo Harbor. Uh, uh -huh. then. Ooh. Ooh. End of the year. -y. So, um, yeah. But, um, and, you know, we have events like these. I mean, granted, the, the Heritage Corridors didn't set them up, but I'm thinking now in our much more interconnected world. Hopefully mm -hmm. all of our different yeah. sites mm -hmm. can collaborate a lot more. Well, let's see here. What other questions have we got? Uh, American Canals also says you have an excellent book, Martha. Um, <laughs> That's so, nice to hear. Uh, let's see, I'm seeing, uh, let's see. This is about the uh, Illinois and Michigan Canal. Um, mm -hmm. Being in a similar situation to the o and &E, Ice Point Mud Lake, do, 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 do. Oh, this wasn't really a question. It was a comment, but most uh -huh. people can read it. So. Also a national heritage area. Yes. Yeah. There we mm -hmm. go. Yes. Um, okay. Here's a good one. Um, do all of these canals now have canal boat rides available on them? Yeah. Can you... Yeah, we do. Yeah. So where, where can you take a canal boat ride on each of your canals? Yeah. So in... For the Ohio and Erie Canal, there are two places and they are outside of the national park. Uh, when this national park was created, we had a gentleman's agreement with those two canal boat rides that we would not compete with them. Uh -oh. So we have one in Canal Fulton and one in Coshocton. But having said that, uh, we only have water at our canal now for like the last 10 to, uh, no, the last 14 miles. So 14 miles northward, we only have water in that section. So one day, um, I am hoping that you can, we have a water trail at the Cuyahoga River, which is the water source. So one day I'm hoping that you can put your kayak in and kayak to a certain point and then bring your kayak over to the Cuyahoga, to the Ohio and Erie Canal and kayak back to your point of origin. Wow. <laughs> Like yeah, the uh, the the Lehigh um, has very little, and of course we never had contiguous canal because the boats went back and forth out onto the river on the slack water. Virtually all of the dams are gone, and the dams were what put water into the ditch parts of the canal. So there are only a handful of places. Um, however, that said, the section that is in Humor Park, which is where the National Canal Museum is and the headquarters of the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor, we have a two and a half mile stretch of canal. And although the guard lock and the lift lock in the park are currently not functional, they are intact. 
And so our boat runs on, um, on part of that stretch. Um, five days a week from uh, late May until the end of September. And now we're just weekends only for another couple of weeks. Um, and it's mule drawn. So. Yeah, nice. Ooh, mule drawn boat. Even mule drawn boat ride. ride. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, the Erie, because it is still an operating canal, we've got a <laughs> number of boat rides. But uh, if you want to go on the historic canal, um, there's our friends at the Camillus Canal Park. Um, they have mm -hmm. a restored aqueduct. Uh, they have pontoon boats, uh, but still a great park um, to check yeah. out. Uh, I believe it probably closed down for the season, or at least boat rides. Um, mm -hmm. But then we also have uh, boat rides in uh, Lockport, Fairport, mm -hmm. Pittsford, and Herkimer are really big ones. You can also even rent out um, these houseboats. Um, yeah, I know like people have done that. I know. I really tried to convince my friends to have that be my bachelor party. <laughs> Sadly, there's a long waiting list um any anyway <laughs> uh we've had a lot of really good questions coming from the chat now um we got uh did the anthracite mines loss of native trees leave lasting environmental damage along the canals um so i think maybe more of just the general resource extraction along all of our canals um, um <laughs> Yeah, well, how it affected the canals, basically, was um, that the Lehigh had horrific floods. And the worst one of all occurred in 1862. And um, it, it occurred, be, uh, it was so destructive because it started up in the gorge where there was not only the timbering industry, but the tanning industry, mm -hmm. where they were just cutting down trees and leaving the trunks. And some of it wasn't even useful wood. The long and the short of it was, was that there was a lot of cut lumber in the tributaries. And there was a horrific rainstorm that lasted about 36 hours. And it broke loose all the retention dams on the tributaries that were holding the logs. And the hills were just clear cut. And the gorge is very, very steep. Um, it, it's a gorge, literally. And so all of this water and rock and everything came pouring down through this very narrow gorge and it picked up steam as it went along. And, mm -hmm. um, and it destroyed every bridge, every lock, um, <laughs> every everything, the beginnings of the trains um, all the way down to Easton. And um, it was, but they, and they never rebuilt the upper navigation but you could see the bare sides of the mountains in the gorge until well into the 20th century. So that was the worst problem. And that was not directly related to the mines themselves. The anthracite mines did a lot of damage in terms of the waste banks, which they're still trying to replace in the, in the coal regions. But yeah, yeah, the, the, the coal regions see a lot of environmental, lasting environmental damage. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, your banks of the Erie also see a lot of environmental damage. Um, I know we have reports, I mean, so the salt industry, for instance, takes off in Syracuse, but there's also a building boom and everything. Like we have accounts I've seen of uh, upstate New York being pretty much deforested by the 1850s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Then, I mean, Onondaga Lake, which Syracuse or Syracuse is located on and right between the Erie uh, and Oswego Canals at one point was one of the most polluted bodies of water uh, in the America, um, using a lot of these resources that were able to be easily and cheaply transported down the canal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we go over to you, Rebecca, who interprets a river that famously catches on fire. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just putting in the chat. Yeah, but your river didn't catch on fire. <laughs> yeah. So I assume, yes, you had some uh, environmental impacts as well. Uh, yes, we have pictures of the um, valley, and from rim to rim, you can see like six trees. Wow. So we need the historic pictures from post-Civil War era. Um, yeah. An interesting, relevant, uh, or uh, modern conversation we're having on our canal as well is, uh, you know, the canal still operates and connects multiple, um, you know, yeah. uh, what are yeah. they called? Watersheds. So. Uh, mm -hmm. New York Canal Corporation is currently trying to figure out what to do with the possibility of invasive species um, mm -hmm. going between the Great Lakes mm -hmm. and the Hudson River. Um, so 
that's, I mean, we're still grappling with a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. See, another good question that's popped up in the chat. Uh, so the Erie Canal was replaced by the barge, which is still in use. Um, what happened to the other canals? What was your fate's? Um... So Go first, Rebecca. Early, <laughs> you had mentioned 1905, which is really funny because our canal was privatized and then the state took it back over. And then finally in 1905, the state put their foot down and said, look, we need these canals for national security. So they took them over and they shut them down to redo them. And they didn't completely reopen the Ohio and Erie Canal until 1909, but they refaced every lock. They um, did major repairs, rebuilt um, aqueducts, moving them away from the former timber structures to structures of iron and steel. And it was a complete refacing. Um, unfortunately, the traffic never quite came back. And then four years later, we had this devastating flood. Uh, the steel companies bought the rights to the last, the steel companies in Cleveland bought the rights to the last 14 miles or so and kept water in that because it was cheaper to maintain 14 miles of canal than it was to buy water from the city of Cleveland. <laughs> well, the, the, the Lehigh and the Delaware, I could bundle two questions there. I saw someone else asked if, if any of these ever made money. The, the Lehigh navigation was extremely financially successful pretty much through the entire 19th century. The peak carrying of anthracite was actually in the mid 1850s when they carried about 1.6 million tons of coal on that 46 miles. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing was in 1857, the Le Le LCN got control of the Delaware Division Canal. Um, Pennsylvania had lost money left and right on the whole Pennsylvania Canal system. And when the Pennsylvania Railroad decided that they would really like this lovely, flat, cleared spaces that the canal was on, they bought most of it. But they didn't want the Delaware for a number of reasons, and, and obviously LCN did. And so they got control of it in 1857. Um, and that, therefore, then made the Delaware Division the only profitable part of the Pennsylvania Canal system because of the coal business. Mm. Um, Ultimately, um, anthracite declined as a fuel, both industrially mm -hmm. and and uh, and and for home use, and so um, and they obviously could never really compete with the railroads. The only thing that really saved the Delaware for as long as it did was that there were coal yards in the little towns along the Delaware that was the only way they could get coal, because um, the railroad did not run anywhere near those those mm -hmm. towns and also connected with anything that went to the coal mines. So um, uh, that was one of the things that prolonged the, uh, the existence of, uh, of uh, both of the canals. So in 31, in fact, it was 92 years ago yesterday, um, uh, LCN handed control of the Delaware Canal back to Pennsylvania and Gifford Pinchot promptly turned it into a state park, which he named after Theodore Roosevelt. So that's one of the reasons it is the still longest towpath canal existing in the United States. There's about 68 miles of it. So it's still there. It frequently doesn't, it doesn't have any water in most of it and it's big issues, but anyway, it's still there and the state's still committed to keeping it running as a recreational area. The Lehigh stumbled on until 1942 and it, in that a series of floods damaged most of the dams mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. it just wasn't worth to, um, to keep rebuilding, especially in wartime. And um, there just was not the demand for coal that way. They were still moving it by trains. There was no reason to stick with water transportation. And that was that. Nice. Yeah. Um, Don, you're, um, I didn't see the, uh, did these canals make money question, but uh, I'd say- yeah, they, they kind really, of flashed by, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say that the Erie did. Uh, New York got in trouble with all of its kind of cockamamie side canals, um, like the Genesee Valley, Black River, um, that were a lot more expensive. Um, yeah, 
Um, there, there comes a cutoff point. Yeah. And that cutoff point, we've done, you know, we've looked at the, the canals and it seems like maybe the Ohio and Erie was the last one that paid for itself. So anything after 1832 that was completed after 1832, your your labor expenses were too high. Mm. Yeah, plus you got the railroad like, to compete against it. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like yeah. Indiana, Indiana sunk a lot of money into canals. But by the time they started building, the cost of labor was so high, the state drove itself into bankruptcy. Uh -huh. Yeah. See, that was the advantage of a privately owned canal because Lehigh owned the Crane Ironworks, which was the, mm -hmm. the first one that they had built. And then the other thing that stood them in good stead for a long time was owning the water rights because they actually went into mm. the hydroelectric business in the early 20th century, too. So mm. um, they had they were a lot more diversified. And then they also bought the Lehigh mm -hmm. New England Railroad. So. They were run by a lot of really smart people um, until about the 1950s when it really went off the rails. <laughs> I mean, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice, yeah. New York always just got to, yeah, got run by us. Um, politicians yeah. made a lot of money off the Erie Canal. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. run. Um, this is an interesting Alfred question. Alfred Kelly been, did really well. Yeah. Yes. He had a lot of speculative businesses. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a question that's it's been asked twice, so I will um, Do you view the Erie Canal as the first public transit project in the U.S.? And I don't know. Uh, would, would we consider? We look at you canal? that way. Okay. Yeah. At least yeah. the Ohio and Erie Canal looks at you as the first public transportation system. Mm -hmm. Not system, but public uh, interstate system. There you go. Yeah, maybe this is one of yeah. the first public yeah. works. Yeah, the yes. fans of the yes. National Road say that that was the first. But, um, you know, I mean, as, when the canals start to be built, they beat everything else for travel in this country, mm -hmm. for comfort, for capacity, um, for, you know, getting to where people wanted to go without, like, rattling their teeth out. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, it's and it really... It really did contribute to interstate too, you know. Mm -hmm. We've got another uh, a contender has been put into the chat. Uh, Bill yeah. Smith's canal. Thank you, Mike. Uh, oh, I bet that's Bill Gerber. No, it was. It was Mike Riley. Uh, oh, it was Mike. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The Middlesex mm -hmm. did exist. The middle, oh, yes, the Middlesex. The Middlesex was a very early success. Yeah. yeah. We're mm -hmm. actually getting a lot of comments about various other canals. I mean, the Miami and Ohio, they've got yeah. a... Uh, they've got uh, boat rides. Ride on. Yeah. yeah. CNO has boat rides. Yeah. Um, yeah. So does um the one at Canal in, um, in Delphi, Indiana, the Wabash. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yes. Wabash has one. Yeah. 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 Our... our our uh, museum director visited there last summer and she was very jealous of the fact that they have a boathouse and a very light boat. They can put it in a cradle, press a button and it comes up out of the water. Whereas <laughs> we have a steel hull wooden boat that weighs 48 tons that sits on a dry dock over the winter right out in the elements. <laughs> that reminded me of the other uh, plug I was going to give when I was talking about canal boat rides. Uh since I know an organization in New York State currently that now has to figure out how to move a gigantic canal boat. Um, if you want to see, um, see um, a historic, a historic canal boat, canal boat, boat well, model historic canal boat, boat moving boat. down the modern barge canal, yeah. Louis yeah. McClure uh, is taking a ride from yeah. Lake Champlain to its permanent new home with the Canal Society of New York out in uh, Fort Byron. So. It's traveling mm -hmm. down the canal. That's, that's really cool. That is really mm -hmm. cool. Yep. Oh, and we got a boat ride on the INM too. Uh, in mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. man, you could you could pretty much do the Great Loop. Uh, a modified <laughs> one on the... You 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 can even you can even get on a, a little boat that apparently takes you through the Union Canal Tunnel in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Um. There, I don't think there's anything left of the canal otherwise, but you can ride through the tunnel. And the tunnel was the first one that was built in the United States. 
Right. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Um. One more. Uh. So someone CNO fan has asked. Uh. You've mentioned eighty-three miles, eighty-six miles. Sorry, the longest towpath canal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's questioning that because CNO one hundred eighty-four is it contiguous towpath? I would assume. Is the... What one? Uh, On the CNO. Yeah, I why think... yours is longer still in existence? No, 68 miles. It's only 68 oh. miles on, okay. on the Delaware. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Yeah. No, uh, what they may be looking at is that the DNL trail, which incorporates towpath and railroad right of way, when it's totally connected between Bristol and Wilkes-Barre, will be 165 miles. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. We're or like 85 percent connected or something like that that so. speaking of trail systems um i know the erie we have a very robust trail system yeah. like yes. that's our most popular way the erie canal is used now is for recreation mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people biking um hiking alongside it is that the case with both your canals as well? yes yes mm -hmm. yeah well mm -hmm. there we go so we've still got these canals thriving. Um, oh yeah, okay. yeah. Um, they're still just, used. Just in still used capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, and uh, we're you know fifteen minutes over here. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm going to get out of the uh, the office here. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. My light keeps going off because it thinks it's too late in the night for me to be here. <laughs> I keep going and turning back on and then it shuts itself down again. I'm like... um, yeah, well, um, I think I think we've reached, sorry if we didn't get to your question um, so far, folks, um, but you know, we've only got so much uh, time and we could, we could, I think, talk about canals for hours. Uh, yeah, I'm sure yeah, there's a few sure. people who could watch that too uh, on this call. But yes, yes. and yeah. check out your canal societies. Check out yes. the American Canal Society. Um, if you have an interest in canal and history, um, there's some great books and some great canal museums yes. out there. So mm -hmm. check them out. Yes. Yep, and yep. Um, uh, also be sure uh, I should mention uh, check out the William T. Pomeroy Foundation if you've got canal history in your town. They've got a great new marker program, uh, historic transportation. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, uh, markers, um, which are sponsoring this program, making it possible to have this conversation. But you too can. Embrace your canal mm -hmm. heritage. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we'll send out a recording after this. Um, it's all right with you guys. Um, can I just let people know your contact info? So yes, I was just going to say that. Yeah, pass along my contact info. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Well, have a good night, everyone, and we'll see you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank Bye, you. Rebecca. Bye. It was Bye. lovely meeting you. And thank you all for listening. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.